Welcome to Proven Improbable. I'm your host, Maurice Jackson. Joining us today is Bart Jaworski. He is the CEO and director of Group 11 Resources, which is known for advanced stage zinc exploration in Ireland. Mr. Jaworski, welcome to the show, sir. Thanks for having me, Maurice. Appreciate it. We're honored to have you on our show, sir. Mr. Jaworski, for someone new to the story, who is Group 11 Resources and what is the thesis you're attempting to prove? Well, uh, our overall thesis is that with the largest land position in the richest country for zinc in the world, that being Ireland, we have a very substantiated vision. And that vision is basically to discover the next big zinc deposit in the country. We already have the second and third largest undeveloped zinc occurrence in the country, that being our Stone Park current resource and uh, the Ballinalac historic resource. And those are second only to Glencore's very substantial Palace Green deposit, which is one of the largest undeveloped zinc deposits in the world. So we have that going for us. People-wise, of course, uh, you need people uh, with the right mindset and experience to, to drive towards this goal of discovery. And we certainly have that part covered um, with Meg Silver as a strategic backer and people like Peter McGaw and Dan McInnes involved, as well as very experienced Irish geologists like John Barry, David Furlong, and, and Dr. Uh, Mark Holdstock, who have spent uh, most of their careers exploring for, for zinc in this country. I think we've got the, all the elements you need to make a, a, a very interesting story. Before we discuss the unique value proposition of Group 11 Resources, I would like to begin our discussion today at the 10,000-foot level regarding zinc. For audience members that may not be familiar with the zinc supply and demand fundamentals, what can you share with us? Okay, so first, uh, a bit about the zinc market. Zinc demand is roughly about 14.14 million tons a year. So that's about $40 billion with a B U.S. turnover per year. That's assuming current zinc prices. Zinc is the fourth most common metal um, consumed after iron, aluminum, and copper. And the price of zinc was really on fire in 2016 and 2017, so roughly doubling from 70 cents a pound to about $1.60 a pound U.S. Then in 2018, the prices took a bit of a breather, falling to about a buck a pound in September this year. And now we're starting to see a rise again towards that $1.20 level. So that's a, a bit, I guess, on the pricing. Um, you might ask what it's used for. So primarily used for galvanizing steel, which means making steel rust proof. And uh, that then feeds the construction and the automotive sectors. Zinc is also an essential nutrient, uh, which is interesting for embryonic growth, normal metabolic processes inside the human body, etc., so that's a bit about the demand side. Now, on the supply side, this is where things get really interesting. Um, a number of mines around the world have been shutting down because they've essentially run out of ore because uh, they're no longer, or they're, I guess, no longer economic to run because, for example, you've seen uh, them starve for capital for too long, etc. So Lachine, Galmoy, and Century are just a few examples of large mines which have recently depleted in ore over the last few years. So this has led to a shortage in mine supply, which in turn has led to diminishing global inventories, which are now down to levels we haven't really seen since 2007-2008. And remember, back then, zinc prices reached a high of $2.08 U.S. a pound. So the question really becomes, why are prices relatively muted now, despite these multi-year inventory lows? Well, I think the key issues are basically, of course, the trade war rhetoric. Um, there are fears over the Chinese economic slowdown. And of course, there's the threat of a supply response. Now, obviously, no one has a crystal ball, but I suspect uh, trade war talks will conclude constructively, or at least I hope so. Uh, the Chinese economy, I suspect, still has a number of very large buffers at its disposal. And one has to wonder, of course, if the trade talks between the U.S. and, and China do indeed falter. The Chinese government could notionally just double down on internal infrastructure growth again, bolstering their Belt and Road Initiative 
even further, for example. So on the supply side response of the equation, as a former mining analyst myself, I've definitely learned over the years that slippage on getting new mines up and running is more often than not. So you always want to take a bit of a pinch of salt or a haircut to the guidance you're given from, from these startup uh, projects in terms of the mining projects. Then is the question of Chinese supply, which is quite interesting. And that Chinese supply accounts for about half of the world's mine supply. Now, historically, it has been the case that whenever zinc prices go up, Chinese supply would also go up, leading to a moderation in the zinc prices. And that has not happened in, in this cycle so far. And the reason is that China basically has imposed a number of strict environmental regulations on, the, on industry in general, and that includes mining, over the last few years. Uh, and the effect has been that a lot of these small mom and pop zinc mines in China have been shut down. And that has suppressed the mine supply response from China in a big way. So that's basically the crux of the market. There is one other key bright spot, which I believe is, is an interesting one to mention here, and it shows a lot of great promise. Uh, and that is the evolution of zinc batteries. Uh, and I think this could potentially be a game changer for the zinc industry. Now, the background here is that zinc was always an ideal metal for batteries uh, ever since Edison's time about 100 years ago. However, the problem always has been rechargeability. You couldn't recharge a zinc battery without getting these needles growing inside the cell and quickly bursting the battery. So a few years ago, a scientific breakthrough by the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory uh, changed all that. And this was written up actually in the prestigious science magazine in April of 2017, by the way. Uh, and I recommend anyone interested in this topic to, to look it up. But basically, with the advent of what's called 3D lattice technology, electric charges uh, can now be dissipated homogeneously enough to prevent these needles growing. And basically, whammo, zinc now has the potential to compete in terms of cost and power with the likes of lithium, lithium ion batteries. And that's pretty exciting. Now, there's obviously small batteries, zinc batteries for cars and small equipment, which I don't think will really move the needle for zinc demand, but there's large zinc batteries aimed for grid power storage. And here's where we could definitely move the needle significantly, I believe, on annual zinc demand globally. So a great example of these large zinc batteries is Nant Energy, which is run by a California-based billionaire named Patrick Soon Xiong, and he's developed a zinc air battery, which basically runs on photons, zinc, and air, and he's demonstrated he can successfully run dozens and dozens of cell phone towers and villages completely off the grid in Africa and in other regions. So that's quite interesting, and there's a great video on Bloomberg, by the way, uh, interviewing Mr. Sun Xiong uh, so on, on this technology, plus the New York Times have recently picked that up as well and uh, written up about it. Group 11 Resources projects are strategically located in Ireland. Provide us with some historic context on the relationship between zinc and Ireland. Well, Ireland is estimated to be number one in terms of zinc found per square kilometer. So that's a basically makes it a very prospective country for zinc. It also hosts some of the world's largest zinc deposits. So, for example, Belidin's Navin Mine and Glencore's Palace Green deposit. It's infrastructure rich and has year-round tide water for for shipping. Um, the product in Ireland is clean and you're very close to consumers, right? Irish zinc concentrates tend to be very good quality. They're clean. And European smelters are essentially just around the corner in Norway, Sweden, Belgium, etc. Now, politically, Ireland is a safe first world jurisdiction with uh, security of tenure and rule of law. And I guess lastly, the Fraser Institute, which, by the way, is the only think tank that ranks world's the world's mining jurisdictions, uh, ranks Ireland number one in terms of policy perception index, five years running. So Ireland has all the ingredients you would ever want in a mining jurisdiction. 
One key aspect to add, I guess, on top of that is that over the last seven years of, of modern mining history in Ireland, the general rule of thumb of what it takes to really break even economically in Ireland is is what's known as the 10 and 10 or 10 million tons at 10 percent zinc and lead combined. So that reflects the infrastructure and tidewater. So in more remote parts of the world, for example, where you, you might need to truck in your diesel and truck out your concentrates, you may need 50 to 100 million tons to break even economically. In Ireland, however, you typically need much, much less. And that is very comforting uh, if you're an investor in, in this space. Bart, now that we know the virtues of exploring for zinc in Ireland, how much of a land position does Group 11 Resources have in Ireland? Well, we have the largest land position of any explorer or miner in the country. Uh, altogether, we hold approximately 3,200 square kilometers. So that's, uh, what, 30, 320,000 hectares or nearly, in terms of acres, that's 800,000 acres. So it's a very, very large position, one of the largest ever assembled actually in the country. And this gives us a dominant position um, in, in the country, but also we cover two geological basins, which gives us the ability to really think big and think outside the box. And this really is what greatly aids our exploration approach. You mentioned approach. Is there anything different that you're doing that others are not? Well, yes, absolutely. So our, our big think approach is really what makes us different. Essentially, we are tearing up the old geology textbooks and, and basically putting them back together again. And we're using a very open-minded and thorough approach to exploration, essentially systematically conducting um, detailed data compilation. Uh, mining da data, by the way, in Ireland goes back all the way to the 1200s and, and beyond in some cases. And, and coupling that with cutting edge te exploration techniques such as seismic surveys, airborne geophysics, ionic leach soil sampling, what have you. Now, not just anybody then can, can really do big think um, and, and you can't really have big think without the ground position, right? Because if you come up with a great idea, it's likely on somebody else's ground. So you can't really do anything about it. Um, so you also can't do the big think without the right people and uh, and the big picture thinkers um, uh, like like Peter McGaugh and Dan McInnes and that's really where they come in as well as the the sort of what I like to call the deep uh, Irish bench strength that we have with the likes of Dr. Mark Holdstock and John Barry and David Furlong so we have the people and we have the ground in order to make big think uh, happen otherwise you just can't have big think. You know a virtue of having the largest ground position in Ireland is that Group 11 has two flagship projects. Let's delve into them, shall we? Mr. Jaworski, introduce us to your flagship project, the Stone Park, and the unique value propositions it presents. Well, at Stone Park, we are very excited because uh, we are right next door to Glencore's Palace Green Deposit, and we think we might have at least some of the key mineralizing faults uh, from that deposit trending onto our ground. So our ground, by the way, covers nearly the entire perspective geology in this area, in this basin, outside of the Glencore ground. We have by far the largest land position in this basin, much bigger than Glencore's area. And we cover about 1,200 square kilometers in this area alone. So that's in acres, that's about 300,000 acres. So we also already have a resource, a maiden resource, which we just put out a few months ago. It's 43101 compliant and it's in the inferred category. And um, that basically totals 5 million tons at 11% zinc and lead. So that's called the Stone Park Deposit. That is located only about a kilometer away from Glencore's Palace Green Deposit. So it's very close to, to the Palace Green Deposit, which ho itself hosts about 44 million tons at 8% zinc, zinc and lead. Now, our deposit is about, in terms of depth, 200 to 400 meters depth, but relatively shallow, whereas Glencore's Palace Green Deposit is roughly starting at 300 meters deep and goes all the way down to 1,300 meters deep from, from public disclosure. And, and their deep uh, or their new discovery that Glencore is talking about is uh, called Cahar Line, which has currently about 10 million tons at 10 percent. 
and they they basically say that it's the deepest part of that depth range. So we can infer it's closer towards the 1300 meter level. So essentially from that, we know that Glencore um, is basically, or that, that Glencore itself, we additionally know that they've been drilling uh, Palos Green since early to 2017. And so from all that above, you can see that our stone park deposit is much shallower and it's about 30 to 40 percent higher grade. So basically that's a, a very good starting point. But the key is this. This is an emerging camp. Uh, the discoveries here at Palace and, and Stone Park are relatively new. And yet, this is already the most metal-endowed region within all of Ireland outside of Belize's Navin deposit. And yet, the main mineralizing structures or faults have not yet been found here. It's a complete mystery. So unlike in, in the rest of Ireland where the zinc deposits are butted up against the fault... Uh, in this camp, the main mineralizing structure appears to be further away somewhere, suggesting that what's been found so far, uh, i.e. Stone Park and Palace Green, is actually the periphery of the system, and its heart may be lurking somewhere underneath what we call these limerick volcanics. So the question becomes, how do we find the center of this zinc system? And this is where the preliminary drilling and the TELUS survey comes in. We announced last week uh, the start of a preliminary 1,500 meter to 2,000 meter drill hole, drill hole program, which will be primarily aimed at answering the big geological questions on essentially the architecture of this camp. If we hit some mineralization as well, that's great, but primarily this is geological in terms of its aim. Now, we're going to couple this drilling data with a large ongoing airborne survey, which is currently being flown by the Irish Geological Survey, and it's called the TELUS survey, and it basically comprises of flying 2,500 square kilometers. So again, in acres, that's about 620,000 acres, and covering our ground, Glencore's ground, and near and the nearby uh, Silver Mines property. That's that's one another one of our properties called the Silver Mines uh, property. So they're covering all three, and they're using state of the art radiometrics, magnetics, and electromagnetics. So essentially, three detection methods in all. And the beauty is that this information will be publicly available early next year, uh, available to see by everybody. And will hopefully tell us where the major faults are, and importantly, how do they line up with the known mineralization in this camp. Now, we have already some suspicions on where the key fault corridors may lie. One clue is that the main palace green body seems to trend in a northwest orientation. And this is from an academic paper that was published back in 2015. And if you continue along that northwest trend, but towards the south, you basically line up perfectly with our Karakittal and our Limerick South prospects. Now, a Karakittal, uh, for example, there are about a half a dozen historic holes which intersect at about 5 meters of 12% zinc and lead, and they've been largely forgotten about since the late 1960s. However, now that we know about Palace Green and we know about Stone Park, these 1960s pro prospects are starting to look a lot like the small satellites that you see just outside of Palace Green to the north, which poses an interesting question, right? Do we have a quasi-mirror image down to the south? So that's basically the idea that we're working on right now, and that's, uh, in, in short, why we're excited on, on, on working on this property. And uh, this is what's going to lead up to the big drill of 2019. Let's move north now and discuss your second flagship project, Ballinalac. What has the company excited there? Well, here we also have an exciting idea that we will be testing as part of the big drill in 2019. So Ballinalac is located about 50 kilometers away from Belidin's giant Navin zinc mine, which has approximately 100 million tons at 10% historically, mostly mined out now, but still operating. It's considered to be, well, it is the biggest mine in Europe and considered to be one of the top five zinc deposits in the world. And Ballinalac now is unique as it is still close enough to Navin to have well-developed Navin beds on the property. In addition to the other prospective horizon in Ireland, which is called the Walsortian Limestone, 
And so, in fact, Ballinalac is the only known zinc occurrence in Ireland that has significant mineralization in both these horizons, i.e. the wall source in limestone, as well as these Navin beds, which host the Navin deposit 50 kilometers away. So with that, interestingly, in the 1970s, when Ballinalac was discovered, the old timers only drilled down the top layer basically down to 300 meters to define the historic estimate that we know now um, and by the way that's 7.7 .7 million tons at 7.3 percent zinc and lead so again not a million miles away from our 10 and 10 rule of thumb so the drilling beyond 300 meters was considered very deep at that time in the 1970s now now of course mining reaches down much much deeper for example Belieden and Palace Green are drilling uh, going down well beyond a kil uh, kilometer or a thousand meters Meters. So that's about in feet, uh, 3,300 feet, right? So the big idea at Balanalak is that the Navin beds directly underneath the historic estimate that we know about in the top layer have not been tested for Navin style mineralization down below in the second layer. And the case in point here, of the 30 holes historically drilled deep enough to actually intersect these lower Navin beds in the vicinity of the old estimate, a surprisingly high number of those holes, about half of them, actually hit significant mineralization. And directly underneath the historic estimate is virtually undrilled. So our preliminary, we, we've actually drilled two holes in this property earlier this year, and we've already announced that. And um, basically, what these two holes were doing is, again, primarily aimed at the geology of the property. Um, and what we successfully identified and showed with those two drill holes is that number one, the cross faults, there are actually cross faults running through the system and they were never really recognized before. And importantly, these cross faults seem to have a lot more to do with mineralization than was ever previously recognized before. And number two, the Ballinac fault itself which is supposed to host most of the mineralization here, is steeper than previously thought, which again shows definitively how the previous drilling in this area missed the target. So those are very important things to know, and um, we're very, very pleased with the results of that. We now have uh, a lot of tools in our, in our, in our uh, wheelhouse here in order to uh, drill in 2019 and really go after the main target. What are your plans going forward at Bell and Lake? Um, basically, we are relogging and in some cases reassaying some of the historic core with the aim of, of sharpening our understanding of the architecture of this area even further. And we will uh, then go ahead and uh, drill this in 2019 as part of the big drill. Of course, as part of the last two holes I forgot to mention, we intersected 10 meters of 10% in an area of known mineralization. So we're already working off known mineralization, some really good intercepts that we just uh, confirmed with our, with our drilling. And so the, the big idea is to sharpen um, the architectural picture of this property even further and then basically attack it with a, a much more aggressive drill hole program in 2019. Mr. Jaworski, are these brown fields explorations that the company is undertaking? Yeah, essentially brownfield, I guess if you if you mean brownfield to, to be uh, previously mined, then no, these were the, our projects have never been previously mined. However, I think in this case, what you're probably alluding to is the notion that in these areas, we have seen significant heavy lifting already done on the exploration side by previous operators, and that is definitely a yes. You know, for someone new to the term brownfields, please share how that improves the probability of discovery. Well, with, with the heavy lifting already done for us, that allows us to get up the learning curve much quicker than if we, for example, had to drill all those initial holes ourselves. So we're walking on the shoulders of basically a giant amount of historic work. And if you infuse that with cutting edge technology and a truly open minded way of thinking, that's really where the magic happens. For current and prospective shareholders, the story doesn't end with zinc. Group 11 Resources recently discovered some silver at the Ballinawak. How was Big Think responsible for the discovery and share the results with us? Well, correct, Maurice. Um, at Ballinawak, only some of the historic intervals were ever assayed for silver. 
And those that were often got really good silver numbers uh, in them, say between 20 to 100 grams per ton silver. And our highest, I believe, historically was about a 380 grams silver. So we know there is at least some silver in the system. And that was never calculated historically or, or really fully assayed historically. So I see that as a potential sweetener, economic sweetener to the story, which has yet to be borne out. Also at Stone Park uh, and the broader Limerick Basin, we have the idea that because you have a lot of volcanics intruding a lot of limestones, you might expect to see some overlooked types of deposits which can host a higher precious metal uh, component to them. For example... Uh, CRD systems, which are typical in Mexico, carbonate replacement deposits, CRDs, you might see that uh, here. You know, you have the same ingredients. So I think that's, for example, uh, what uh, potentially captured the imagination of Peter McGaw and originally back in 2015 when, when he sort of got uh, introduced to the story. So I, th I think all that I've mentioned above speaks to this sort of open-minded approach that we have and, and again, uh, hence the, the big think. What is management's philosophy? Are you looking to build mines or are you focused on exploration? Well, I think similar to most juniors, our natural exit strategy would be to make a large discovery and uh, and then sell it to the highest bidder. Um, we do not intend to, to essentially become miners, though. Switching gears, I learned from some of the most respected names in the natural resource space, from Rick Rule, Doug Casey, Giant Bandari, Mickey Fulp, and Bob Moriarty, that the people running the business are equally, if not more important, than the latent material in the ground. Mr. Jaworski, please introduce us to your board of directors and management team, and what unique skill sets do they bring to Group 11 Resources? Okay, well, great question. Uh, we have four on the board currently. So Dan McInnes is our chairman. He is the retired C CEO of Mag Silver and currently sits on the Mag board. Dan has over 40 years experience in the industry and has been involved with about seven discoveries during his career, including Duck Pond, Cinco de Mayo, uh, Juan Escipio. Interestingly, Dan worked in Ireland for five years back in the late 70s and the early 80s with Naranda. So he's definitely he, he definitely knows the lay of the land in Ireland. Um, Alessandro Batelli is our chair of the audit committee and he is currently the CFO of Lundin Gold and, and interestingly he was the CFO of Redback when it was taken over for 10 billion dollars by Kinross back in 2010. Uh, Brendan Cahill is a lawyer and all around very sharp guy. He's the CEO of Exelon Resources uh, and those guys are mining the Platosa silver deposit in Mexico. So that's essentially the board. On the management side, John Barry and David Furlong who are co-founders uh, with myself Self, and um, who I mentioned earlier, and they are Irish geologists, uh, ex Rath Downey Resources, which is another European zinc development uh, company. John was actually the founder and the CEO of Rath Downey. So both John and David have uh, deep experience with Irish style zinc deposits and, and essentially operating in Ireland. Dr. Uh, Mark Holstock is a very well respected geologist and very well known geologist in Ireland, and he just recently joined us in early 2018. And he led, for example, the team that discovered the 20 million tons. Swex uh, extension to the Navin ore body. So John, David, Mark, and myself, uh, we're, we are a home team. All of us live in the country we're actually operating in, and, and that's different. And, and of course, a very big plus. We have our ear very close to the rail. And then quickly then, uh, just to mention uh, advisors, uh, Peter McGaw is uh, basically the brainchild behind Mag Silver's success in Mexico with the Juan Escipio discovery. And Peter is the chief exploration officer of MAG, and, and he's a really big help on our Big Think uh, initiative. John Prochnow and Frank Hallam are also advisors. So John Prochnow is, you mentioned Doug Casey. So John Prochnow is on Doug Casey's Exploration Hall of Fame, for, for example, uh, for his Eskel and Alligator Ridge discoveries. John also worked, um, interestingly, in Ireland in the 70s and worked particularly on our Ballinalak project back, back then. 
Uh, Frank Hallam has a lot of experience on the M&A front, uh, especially with the majors, and has been involved with over a billion dollars of, of financings over his career. And last but far from least, uh, I have to mention uh, Sean Heinrichs, our CFO, a uh, very capable CFO, and uh, Spiros Kakos, who just joined us in June to help us tell the story, and he's uh, VP of uh, Investor Relations. Tell us about Bart Jaworski. What makes him qualified for the task at hand? Well, a bit, a bit about myself, I guess I'm an exploration geologist and ex-mining equity analyst. I've got about 24 years experience in the industry since 1994. That was my first year in the field. And um, I was uh, an analyst for about 12 years with Raymond James in Vancouver. Uh, and then that was for, for about nine years. And then uh, for about three years at Davie in Ireland. Um, I've been on a lot of site visits. I met with a lot of CEOs and VPXs over over that time frame. Also covered many, many exploration and mining companies over the years. Um, and the reason, I guess, you might ask why I actually ended up in Ireland is my wife is Irish. So um, she wanted to move back home after uh, being in Canada for nine years with me. And that's how we uh, that's how I essentially ended up at Davie in Dublin, covering the UK listed golds plus Rio Tinto and uh, the iron ore sector. And in terms of uh, as an exploration geologist, my experience there, I, d I discovered uh, the original soil anomaly at Coffee Creek in the Yukon, which later became a multi-million ounce gold deposit, which, as you as you may know, was sold for about a half a billion dollars uh, recently, a few years ago, when Gold Corp took over Kamenak. And um, I was, I guess, lastly helped uh, discover some industrial minerals, um, uh, pods of mineralization in the Iskid area near SNP in British Columbia, going back even further. So that's a bit about my background. Let's discuss some numbers. Tell us about your share structure, options, warrants and cash position okay so we have just under 60 million shares outstanding uh, so at the current share price our market cap is roughly eight uh, million dollars Canadian so that's about six million US that's at 14 cents uh, Canadian per share about 20 million warrants and, and options outstanding and more than half of those are set to expire uh, in December so quite uh, quite a uh, short period from now and you mentioned cash so our, our last quarterly financials we have 3.2 Canadian 3.2 million Canadian dollars in the till and of course no debt what is your burn rate Burn is about a hundred thousand to one hundred thirty thousand per month, so call it roughly about a million and a half per annum. So our runway is still fairly comfortable, at least twelve to fifteen months ahead of us, uh, doing what we need to do, depending on hard, how hard we basically press on the uh, gas pedal. Do you have institutional investors at this point? Yes, we were very lucky to uh, and, and very pleased to garner the support of about a dozen institutions mostly during the IPO but some pre IPO and some post IPO so we're very thankful for that support I guess the most uh, well-known institutions would include Sprott, US Global, Galileo and, and I guess uh, Logic. What is the float? Float. About half of our 60 million shares is owned by high net worth individuals, so that's about 30 million shares. The rest of it is owned by MAG. Tech uh, have 5.6% uh, of us, uh, the funds, obviously, and, and the insiders. Are there any change of control fees? And if yes, please convey the terms. Okay, so there are no change of control fees for, for an M&A transaction per se, but there are fees associated with termination, for example, which I think is a fairly standard thing. So when a management um, uh, contract is, is uh, terminated by the board, then there are provisions for, for, for that. When is the last time you purchased shares and at what price? Well, actually, uh, I bought shares just last week on the heels of our press release last week uh, announcing the startup of drilling. So I bought at uh, 13 cents and 12 and a half cents. And I believe at least one other insider bought shares uh, a day later um, on, on the heels of last week's press release as well. So they would have been also buying at those at those levels. Any redundant assets such as patent mining claims or reversionary interests? 
No, we don't, we don't have any patent mining claims in Ireland. Uh, we own all of our licenses 100%, except for Ballinalac, where we have 60% interest, uh, with the remainder owned by a large Chinese zinc producer called Non Femet, based just outside of Hong Kong in Shenzhen. Uh, and at Stone Park, where, where we own roughly 77%, with the remainder owned by a small Irish exploration company called Connemara, which is listed on the uh, AIM market in London. And importantly, these joint venture interests are participating, so they have to pay their share of the exploration costs or they get diluted down. All right, sir, you survived the storm. Mr. Jaworski, multi-layered question. What is the next unanswered question for Group 11 Resources? When should we expect results and what will determine success? Well, the results, uh, we are currently doing a preliminary drill campaign, 15 to 2,000 meters, um, and we should have results from that over the coming weeks and months. The results of the TELUS survey will also be forthcoming early next year, and that will tell us a lot, as I mentioned, about where these faults are and, and, and how they fit basically in relation to the known mineralization. Uh, we will then uh, couple those two data sets, uh, the, the drill da data and the airborne data, and that should lead us to a very, um, very high priority drill targets, which will be part of our big drill of 2019. And a few months ago, we put out a, a maiden resource on Stone Park. 5 million tons at 11% zinc and lead combined. We are working on an update uh, to the Balanlac historic estimate. Not sure if we can update uh, that um, without doing more re-drilling. Re so um, we, we're not sure if that can come out or not, but we'll see. We, it's something else that we're, we're working on. What keeps you up at night that we don't know about? Well, I'm an optimist. Uh, we are, uh, so I think as, as long as uh, people keep remembering the lessons of, uh, like I, I like to say, Adam Smith and, and the wealth of nations, I think we'll, we'll be okay and the world economy will keep on growing and, and with it, so will the prosperity of, of humanity. Other than that, I uh, try not to sweat the small stuff, but on Group 11, obviously, exploration is a risky and cyclical business, so one needs to be aware and cognizant of that. However, with the high risk comes high reward, and that's really what I'm personally focused on as a, as a shareholder myself. Finally, what did I forget to ask? Well, I guess one important element of the Irish exploration landscape is the support from the government, specifically ICRAG. Now, ICRAG stands for the Irish Centre for Research in Applied Geosciences. And this is a government industry academia partnership, well-funded, and uh, a number of very smart people working on uh, a number of fronts, basically. One of the, their main remits of, of ICRAG is to help companies like Group 11 find the next big zinc mine in Ireland. So, interestingly, the individual who recently stepped into the role of CEO and director of ICRAG is a gentleman by the name of Dr. Murray Hitzman. Now, Dr. Hitzman uh, was once at the White House shaping science and technology policy, for example, as well as he was the head of the Colorado School of Mines, and more recently he was at the U.S. Geological Survey. And he is one of the leading experts on Irish-style zinc deposits and has written many an academic paper on the subject. So when Murray was announced as the head of ICRAG back in uh, PDAC of this year, uh, I personally thought that that was a major signal uh, by the Irish government and also a, a very strong catalyst really for the future of discoveries in Ireland. For someone listening that wants to get more information on Group 11 Resources, please share the website address. It's www.group11resources.com and the 11 is the word 11 spelled out. As a reminder, Group 11 Resources trades on the TSXV symbol ZNG and on the OTCQB symbol GRLVF. For direct inquiries, please contact Spiros Kakos at 604-630-8839, extension 503. That number again is 604-630-8839, extension 503. 
He may also be reached at s.cackles at group11resources.com. And last but not least, please visit our website, provenimprobable.com, where we interview the most respected names in the natural resource space. You may reach us at contact at provenimprobable.com. Bart Jaworski of Group 11 Resources. Thank you for joining us today on Proven and Probable. Thanks again, Maurice. Much appreciated. All the best to you, sir. Thank you for joining us today on Proven and Probable. Remember to like and subscribe for more conversations with the most respected names in the natural resource space. Check out our website at www.provenandprobable.com. The information presented on Proven and Probable is provided for educational and informational purposes only, without any express or implied warranty of any kind, including warranties of accuracy, completeness, or fitness for any particular purpose. The information is not intended to be and does not constitute financial, investment, or trading advice, or any other advice. You should not make any financial, investment, or trading decision based on any of the information presented without first undertaking independent due diligence and consultation with a professional broker or competent financial advisor.